All right, let's go through chapter 46 now, focusing on animal reproduction. Uh, reproduction, of course, is a big deal for life. It's one of the characteristics of living things, the ability to reproduce more of your kind. Um, there are lots of permutations of this in the animal kingdom, with some animals that can reproduce asexually, like um, sea anemones, for example, can just sort of split into two. Um, something like a hydra has a little clone butt off the side that then breaks off. Um, but in animals, well, asexual reproduction is quite common in, of course, bacteria and plants and fungi and stuff. In animals, it's actually more the exception. Most animals are reproducing sexually. Um, and most animals have separate male and female sexes. Now, there are some, like earthworms, that are, that are hermaphrodites. That is, they are both male and female, and here we see a couple earthworms. Um, they fertilize each other. They do not fertilize themselves, but they are fertile in both producing male and female gametes. So that's a bit unusual amongst animals. Um, so most animals have, like I said, separate sexes, uh, males and females. Um, now, how they mate will vary a great deal. You, of course, have amphibians, <coughs> like these frogs here, who have external fertilization. The female releases a bunch of eggs, and the male then releases his gametes to fertilize them out in the water. Um, he, he literally does kind of hug her in this, this action called amplexus when they get together, and that sort of helps stimulate her to release all those eggs. Um, now, uh, many other animals, though, have internal fertilization, and um, now the um, life history of an animal can vary a great deal. And the life history is the pattern that that organisms of a particular species follow through their life. That is, most basically, how long do they live? What is their lifespan? Um, how many times do they reproduce in their life? Is there just one reproductive event? Or are there many? Do they produce lots of offspring or relatively few? Um, what level of parental care do they provide to their offspring? While there are always exceptions, some general rules are is that um, if you reproduce only once in your lifetime, you tend to produce a lot of offspring. Uh, but when you produce a lot of offspring, you tend not to give them much, if any, parental care, whereas relatively long-lived organisms with a long lifespan, each time they reproduce, will reproduce relatively few offspring and provide significant care to them. Now here's one that's sort of an exception. It's a water bug, this insect. And insect, insects tend to have lots of offspring, and they often don't really give them any kind of care. But here, this is an example where the female lays the fertilized eggs on the back of the male, and he carries them around and fans water on them to make sure they're getting plenty of water and oxygen and generally protects them. So it's kind of an interesting, same as similar to the uh, male seahorses, the male carries around fertilized eggs and the babies and actually gives birth to them. So here is uh, some type of flatworm. It's just a type of animal and some of the main parts you might see in such an animal. Um, of course you'll have testes on the male, s male part that produce the gametes. A tube that connects it to the sperm duct here from both of the testes. Um, Seminal vesicle is very common, and it's a, a set, it's a gland that produces compounds that then become part of the part of the semen. On the female side, of course, you must basically have the ovaries that produce the produce, produce the eggs, the oviduct that the eggs travel through. Um, sometimes you'll have a yolk duct, um, particularly if those eggs are deposited or, or endowed with a significant amount of oak, a yolk on the yolk gland, and then the the uterus where the fertilized eggs developed in internal fertilization. And again, variations on the theme with insects, these, uh, these bees here, <coughs> um, internal fertilization in this type of animal. Um, one thing that's a little interesting about bees, as I understand it, is the females can mate with multiple males but the males have the ability to remove the sperm from previous matings. Um, and so they can sort of uh, 
skew the odds towards them that they will be the father as long as they're the last ones to mate with the female. All right, well, let's jump to humans. Of course, the female parts here. Um, <clears throat> got the ovary, of course, producing the eggs, and the oviduct, otherwise known as the floping tube, traveling down to the uterus, this muscle that can expand greatly, of course, during pregnancy. Um, and then um, the more external parts of the female reproductive anatomy as well to sort of cover this this opening and protect it, and then others for um, stimulation during intercourse. Um, and so, of course, with a couple ovaries, those oviducts or fallopian tubes. Um, we'll get to the particulars of the ovary in a minute. And again, that muscular wall of the uterus that can expand quite a bit, and of course is very powerful when it comes to squeezing out that baby. The endometrium, the lining of the uterus, we'll get to that in a minute. So you got the cervix, which is the opening to the uterus. Um, during pregnancy, this is blocked uh, by a mucus plug that prevents anything from getting in there and could <clears throat> possibly have a negative effect on the baby. All right, on the male side, um, of course we have the testes that produce the, um, the, um, the sperm cells. The epididymis, this long tube, and it's really, you can't really tell there, but it's this very long tube that really, that uh, connects to the vas deferens, which passes the seminal vesicle, and the seminal vesicle, again, produces compound, produces compounds that are part of the semen. Same with the bulbothereal gland, and these converge into the, um, the urethra here, which is the tube that leads out the, of the penis. And, all right, prostate gland also produces compounds that become part of the semen, and it's, in, it's a gland that in older men often becomes enlarged and enlarged and can lead to uh, prostate cancer, something unique to men. And here you see a little more of that epidermis. It's, so you can see in the testes, there's all these tubes where you're producing uh, um, um, t um, sperm cells. And this long epididymis, it's extremely long. They just wind their way through there, and it takes several days um, for a single sperm cell to complete the journey from the testes on out the body. <coughs> Ones that aren't used will simply be reabsorbed by the body, recycled, if you will. All right, gametogenesis, the formation of gametes. So here we are in females' oogenesis. We start out with some diploid stem cells, the oogonium, and of course they can just recreate themselves, but then they can also begin the process of meiosis, and when that happens, they're known as a, first as a primary oocyte that goes through meiosis one to become the secondary oocyte. Um, generally, they get sort of stuck at that stage, and um, it's only after um, ovulation and fertilization that they complete meiosis two and become a, an ovum um, or basically a fertilized egg or a zygote and so you can see in the over here we have um, this thing called the follicle that contains this secondary oocyte and ovulation is when that um, that secondary oocyte is released from the ovary and this ruptured this follicle becomes what's called the corpus luteum, and we'll see that plays a role in controlling the or regulating the female cycle. Here's a rather scary picture, but this is uh, looking inside a woman, and here's her ovary, and this is one of those follicles that's getting ready to sort of burst open and release release the secondary oocyte. Imminent ovulation. Spermatogenesis, again in the testes, you've got these tubes, these seminiferous tubules, where all these sperm cells are being made. They converge on the epididymis, this long tube that again just twists around here. Um, diploid stem cells that reproduce themselves, but then some of them become the primary spermatocyte, which will then go through meiosis one to become secondary spermatocyte, and the meiosis two to become the, the sperm cells. Now notice a big difference here between the male and the female. The female only ends up with one viable gamete. The others become what are called polar bodies. There is um, unequal division of the cytoplasm during meiosis such that most of the cytoplasm ends up in one 
viable cell, whereas in the male, they all are equally viable. And of course, the male produces a lot of them. Female cycle. Um, so here up in the hypothalamus, gonadotropin releasing hormone, stimulating the pituitary to release follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. These sort of get the cycle started. Um, they begin the development of the follicle. And then what happens is when ovulation happens, there's a spike in the release of luteinizing hormone. And um, <coughs> so this also helps prepare the uterus. So when the LH and FSH are relatively low, the uterine lining is being uh, sloughed off. This is when a woman is having her period. But then those levels begin to increase a bit, which causes an increase in the estrogen levels. And these stimulate the buildup of the lining, that endometrium of the uterus. <coughs> All right, after ovulation, the corpus luteum uh, stimulates a increase, significant increase in the um, progesterone levels. And these all help to, again, continue the buildup of that endometrium. Um, if fertilization happens and an embryo implants on the uterus, of course, the uterine lining will be maintained. But if not, those levels will drop off and the uterine lining will then be sloughed off, starting the cycle over again. Now you'll notice, um, in terms of the cycle, day one, or the time zero is when um, the period starts. And it's about 14 days, 15 days after that, when ovulation occurs, that essentially a woman is most fertile, most likely to become pregnant. Um, the male cycle is a bit simpler. You have the same hormones involved, gonadotropin releasing hormone, FSH and LH, but of course here they promote the stimulation or the production of uh, sperm cells and the production of testosterone um, leading to the secondary sex characteristics. And really no cycle, it's just kind of happening all the time from when a male reaches puberty up until advanced age. Okay, fertilization typically happens in the oviduct or the fallopian tube. And so by the time the embryo implants in the endometrium, it's rather well developed and is typically at the blastocyst stage, this hollow ball stage. Implants and the structure called the trophoblast is produced, which is going to become the placenta. And in placental mammals, of course, the placenta is the connection between the mom and baby. There's no direct connection between the blood flow, but mom's blood flow is released into the endometrium. And there are these capillaries from the baby, from the baby's umbilical artery and umbilical vein that then absorbs nutrients from mom's blood and releases waste in the mom's blood. So mom is essentially processing the baby's waste and providing food for the baby. Good example of positive feedback here during pregnancy. So essentially a mature or a baby that's ready to, to come out um, is going to release um, um, oxytocin and this is going to stimulate uterine contractions. And this has positive feedback for the mom to produce more oxytocin. And so this process just kind of builds up and speeds up such that the contractions become more intense, they become more infrequent until finally the baby's out and then this process stops or slows down quite a bit. Um, of course, babies are supposed to come out head first. That's the normal way, um, the easiest way for them to come out. Sometimes they're not coming out that way and they have to manipulate them or even sometimes resort to a C-section. But typically that's how they, they come out. Um, the um, placenta is often also known as the afterbirth that comes out as well. Um, and this slide just shows again the different steps of reproduction and the points in the step where different types of um, birth control methods are useful for um, preventing pregnancy from happening if one does not want to get pregnant. Um, so there you have it, animal reproduction.